Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your presence this morning in what I hope will be an interactive conversation about the education paradox, which I'll describe in a moment. My name is Fernando Rimers, and I am a professor of education at, at Harvard University. Uh, we have here a splendid panel that is going to provoke you, I hope, and invite you into a conversation. And I'm going to ask that they briefly introduce themselves, uh, beginning with Yolanta. My name is Yolanta Okuniewska. I'm from Poland. I'm a primary school teacher. My students are seven and eight years old now. I use technology in my classroom and write, uh, run international projects. My name is Esteban Mulrich. I'm the Minister of Education in Argentina. I am married. I have five kids from 13 to 1. So I have an educational experiment in my house. My wife is here with me. <laughs> She's the best teacher I know. Hi, my name is Yiling Lo. I'm the Head of Strategic Planning and Academic Quality at the National Institute of Education Singapore, which prepares all teachers for Singapore. And um, I've been involved in work on teacher education for the last 17 to 18 years. Happy to be here. Hi, my name is Aditya. Uh, I represent Kaivalya Education Foundation. We work with governments and leaders of education within government to help transform leadership and therefore enable 21st century skills in students. Thank you, Aditya. So let me explain how we're going to do this. I'm going to frame our conversation. Then each of our panelists is going to share some opening remarks, provocations, really, to engage you in our thinking. They're then going to have some discussion with each other. And then we're going to hear from you and have a conversation. So let me describe the paradox. Paradox, in my mind, comes from the fact that you've all heard that there is nothing that a small group of people cannot achieve. And indeed, we have wonderful examples in education of how when people set their minds to do something, they achieve it. Best example of that is the achievement of universal education, of basic years of education. Seven decades ago, the vast majority of the world's kids did not have the opportunity to set foot in a school. And they do today because a group of people, a little bit bigger than the group of people assembled here, decided to include the right of education in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is, in my mind, one of the most significant transformations that humanity has experienced, to have gone from a species that did not have a shared collective experience of any sort to living at a time when most of humanity has spent at least nine years of their lives in schools. However, the paradox comes from the fact that in spite of the fact that certainly those in this group, and I assume most of you recognize, that the world has changed quite a bit since 1947 when the right of education was included uh, until today, and that those changes require that students develop a range of competencies, not just basic competencies. So we are trying to educate kids for complex thinking, collaboration, for self-knowledge. We're finding it very difficult to do that. And so it almost seems as if the kind of leadership that helped us advance in access is inadequate to help us respond to the adaptive challenge of educating for relevance. So that's the paradox. We want to do something, and we can't do it. I have the pleasure of working with two of the colleagues here and others, my colleague, Dr. Connie Chung, who's in the audience, and other members in what we think is the Gen Genome Project of 21st Century Education the Global Education Innovation Initiative. You can find us online. Our first product of our research is this book, uh, which you can already find in Harvard Ed Press or Amazon, Teaching and Learning for the 21st Century. And our goal in this project is to understand what are the competencies that help students thrive in the 21st century, to what extent are public schools providing the opportunity to gain those competencies, and what can we do to accelerate this process of reform. And so I'm going to ask. Aditya Natraj to get us started in this conversation. Then I want to ask Jolanta, as a teacher, as an exemplary teacher in Poland and for the world, to tell us what she thinks about these competencies and what are the challenges in advancing them. Then I'm going to ask Minister Bullrich to talk about his point of view on whether these goals are realistic, too ambitious, and why is it not happening. And then I'm going to come to Eileen to talk to us about what is it that Singapore has done in this respect and what are the challenges in Singapore. And then we're going to hear them interact a little with one another, and then we want to bring you in the conversation. Aditya. Great. Uh, thank you, Fernando, for setting that up. Uh, just to expand it a little bit more, we are working with six, as part of this Global Education Innovation Initiative, we're working with 
China, institutions in China, Singapore, uh, India, Mexico, Chile, uh, and the US to try and see across the world have the goals actually expanded in the curriculum in the last 30, 40 years, or the goals are still at numeracy and literacy, or have they expanded? That was the first question. So just looking at our policy frameworks, looking at our curriculum frameworks, looking at our textbooks and our professional development across countries. It's a three-year long study, and it has really, the good news about this, it is across the board, there has been an expansion of learning goals. Across the board, from every country, Mexico, Chile, Singapore, India, China, everyone has expanded the goals versus what it was 30 years ago. The bad news, however, is that it has not necessarily been backed up with money, professional development, better curriculum, and new systems. There has not been a backup of this. So it's largely small initiatives that have happened within this larger curriculum framework. Uh, for example, what you do in your own set of schools, an individual teacher or a group of, you know, a small district might do it. But on scale, no country, except what we found in Singapore, no other country has really been able to expand the goals and cause implementation. And this is the inherent gap, that you know, you've expanded goals, but there's no implementation. And so even if we take India as an example, uh, the Indian leadership had a huge process between 2002 and 2005 called the National Curriculum Framework. They designed it with over 300 focus group discussions, <coughs> And they've produced 17 position papers on what science, how science should be taught, why science should be taught, how value should be taught. And all this happened between 2002 and 2005. But the actual, there's no money behind it at 2005. There's no additional money for teacher professional development. There's no additional money for reorienting leadership. Uh, and there is no effort in that direction. As a result, we see the implementation today is probably the same as what it was in 2005. So I think that's the gap in uh, most countries, and especially with education systems uh, like ours, which is a post-colonial system, this education administration is largely designed around every other civic administration, which is for law and order and tax collection. It is not designed around empowering. It is not designed around allowing autonomy. It is not designed around discussion. And so unless the leadership in these countries significantly changes, and we do something significant for the leadership to change their style of engaging with teachers, allowing autonomy, engaging with innovation, being excited and celebrating that rather than, you know, uh, sort of the talk and talk that they do at the moment with teachers. I don't think this is going to change. Very helpful, Aditya. Thank you. So we have this implementation gap. We have aspirations not backed up by action. And either we, we could argue it's because we don't know what it, it is that needs to be done to bring this to scale, or we know, but implementation is breaking down somewhere. Jolanta, how do you see this as a, as a classroom teacher that works you work at the early levels, right, with seven and eight-year-olds. Yeah. What do you think about these goals of the curriculum, and how do you teach them, and what helps you, uh, in effect, respond to these aspirations? Yeah. <coughs> I teach little students, so for me, it's very important to teach them uh, writing, Yeah, uh, can we have the sound for her, please? Yes, go ahead. Is it fine? Go ahead, speak into the mic, yeah. Okay, so for me, it's important to teach them reading, writing, counting, but it isn't enough. Now I know that it isn't enough. Uh, our curriculum helps us to develop it. It uh, doesn't say that uh, you should stop with this one. You can develop it. I, can, I have freedom to do it. And there are many teachers in Poland, they write their own program to develop, not, and not only focus on the cognitive skills, you know. And I found seven years ago, I found a program. It helped me to give my students new knowledge <coughs> about themselves, about other world. It's called Itwini. It is a program for cooperation uh, among teachers in Europe, mostly. And uh, I run project with my students. And it's, I focus on uh, cognitive skills, because while running project, I teach them how to read, how to write, how to uh, count correctly, yes, but we also develop personal skills uh, and how, we do you, learn. how do you do that? For example, we found uh, we, we should enroll for this uh, program, we should register, and I found a partner, for, for example, in Romania, we establish a topic, we are going to, uh, for example, cooperate about the weather in our country. So our students will develop writing skills, 
while, while writing in mother tongue, mm. but also in English. They will learn English words about the weather. They will cooperate in groups in classroom, then in international groups to, pre to prepare, for example, uh, e-books about weather in Romania and in Poland. But the first step is to show the students that the world is different, we have differences, but also similarities. And this is very important for us. So it seems to me that in engaging your students in cooperative learning, in this kind of project-based learning uh, that yeah. includes cooperation with peers in other countries, you find a way to help them develop some of these 21st century skills. And it seems to me that you have developed a nice parallel between the pedagogy you're using with your students and with your fellow teachers, in that you're doing the same thing. You have created, mm -hmm. This is good for students, mm -hmm. for, the, for their future. Mm -hmm. And I uh, do it with, uh, with pleasure. I must admit that I do it with pleasure. So Esteban, if all the teachers in Argentina uh, had the initiative that Jolanta has, your challenge would be an easy one, right? <laughs> yeah, it, w it would be. Um, but still, the teachers will have the problem that having politicians above them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, as I was listening to you and Aditya about this paradox and this gap, um, I use an image uh, when, I, when I talk about it that I think describes how we politicians look at the system and, and, and the problems we face and, and um, in trying to make this reform towards 21st century skills. Um, we are looking at the system as an old car, right? And we're upgrading the car, so small upgrades to a car instead of building a new spaceship. And so unless we get out of the car model, the reform is not going to come. Mm -hmm. But we feel too comfortable upgrading the car mm -hmm. because we see improvements, small improvements, mm. right? You know, the, the car now has a, we, we left the cassette player and we were playing CDs and now an MP3. So it's two upgrades, but we're still on, on, on the road and, and driving the car. We, we don't have to open the window to turn the, the mirror the rear view mirror, we can do it with an automatic thing from inside the car, mm. but still it's a car. So, so we need to get out of the car, right? Um, and, and, and to do that, we need to show that reform is possible. Because the biggest problem we face today, I think, is that education is seen as a, as a political cost for politicians, not seen as a political benefit. Um, the results are seem to be long term, even though you can see in, re in deep reforms, you can see results very short term. You see results in teachers, for example. If the mot motivated teachers will show up immediately if they, are, they feel respected, they feel free to, to be in, uh, proactive in, in their initiatives, if they feel they are supported, if they are paid well, if they are trained well, if they are, uh, if they back again become center of communities, um, then we will, you will see results immediately. Mm. Um, the problem is uh, we are, we're not able, I think, yet, uh, and now I, I left the political side for, for a while, but as reformists, we're not able yet to, to show to politicians that there is no real cost in, in, in deep reform. If you do the reform in a way that you include teachers in the mm. reform, the problem is that reforms are seen as being against teachers. Mm. Um, and and, and, and I, I see a good evolution in the unions today that can help uh, bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have to think about the factor of decision makers who may conclude that it is too difficult to do these things and therefore decide to invest in something else. Maybe that's why we see so many people giving laptops to children without thinking through what's going to go into the laptop or the iPads. Because uh, it's easy, right? I mean, buying a computer is easy and giving a computer away is easy. Um, we, I did that when I was minister of the city of Buenos Aires. Uh, we, we gave away computers. But before giving one computer away, we went to Uruguay, where they had a Ceval plan, mm -hmm. which was a similar program to the one we wanted to launch. And we talked to them and said, I mean, what mistake did you make when, when you were launching the program? And they said, the first one was, we didn't train teachers in advance, mm -hmm. right? 
and the problem is, and, and this was said uh, in, the, in the previous session here, that technology is just a tool. But if you, if you don't teach teachers how to use the tool, they're not, they're gonna misuse it or they're not gonna use it. And, you, and in Uruguay, the problem was they're not using them yeah. as a tool. Um, and, and so we train the teachers in advance and, and the usage of the computer in pedagogy uh, in the, in the uh, Argentinian schools reach the same level as Uruguay in, in, le in less than half the time. Mm -hmm. Now, the truth is the, the, the impact overall, and, and Andrea Schleicher was uh, showing this yesterday, has not been shown yet. Mm -hmm. and, and there is a lot of argument on, on, on why, why that is. I still think um, technology should be a, a, a part of the classroom. But I, I don't think that uh, we should simplify the thing as just giving computers or technology away. Thank you, Stefan. So, very important message here is we have to show that it's possible. Eileen, I wonder if you could say a word about the emphasis of the Global Education Initiative. And again, the book is Teaching and Learning in the 21st Century on, on learning from what works, identifying examples of success, and what can we learn from Singapore, and what are some of the positive examples in the other cases discussed in the book? Um, I'd first like to paint a very uh, quick background about Singapore. We have developed very quickly, in fact, we're a very young nation, and we celebrated our Golden Jubilee last year. Unfortunately, it also coincided with uh, the death of our founding father, Lee Kuan Yew. So we are going to be 51 this year, and in a matter of 50 to 51 years, we have developed from mud flats to a modern metropolis. So what is the secret of success, as it were? Well, put very simply, Singapore places extreme emphasis on education. To give you some facts and figures, the projected expenditure on education in 2015 was 12.1 billion Singapore dollars, or about 3% of our GDP. Our literacy rate aged 15 and above is at 96.7%. And of course, the economic um, success as measured by the GDP per capita is one of the highest in the world at 51,904 US dollars. We have a very small teaching workforce compared to other systems that we studied about 33,000 teachers and about 360 schools. Some of you who attended the Ed Talk yesterday uh, would have heard my director, Professor Kanu Kwei, speak about some of the success factors. I'd like to cover these very, very quickly. The first is about selecting and attracting the best and the brightest into the teaching profession. So you may ask, what do you consider to be the best and the brightest? First of all, the top one third of each primary one going cohort is selected um, just for the interview. And then there's a very rigorous interview panel that selects um, the success rate is at least one in eight. But these are not strict quotas that are set, but the fact that the panel is really looking for people who have the attitude, aptitude, and personality for teaching. That's the first so-called secret of success. Mm -hmm. The second is offering them a very competitive compensation package in terms of um, graduating teachers they earn as much as beginning accountants and lawyers in the civil service, and also offering them three differentiated career tracks to develop them according to their own aptitude within the profession. There's the teaching track for those who love to be teachers. There's the leadership track for those who can be developed to be school leaders, as well as um, officials within the Ministry of Education. There's also the specialist track that develops people and um, the ministry would sponsor their higher degree so that they can be specialists in the subjects um, you know, that they study. Thirdly, as Andrea Schleicher has shared, we, have, uh, we do cherish teachers a great deal. In fact, the central message from the beginning of our independence to today is that teachers are nation builders. So every day as I drive from campus, I get to see a billboard uh, from a bus, from a public bus that drives the students into campus that says, teachers, shaping the future of our nation, one student at a time. So the message of teachers being centrally tied to nation building is something that I've also seen in Finland, which also happens to have um, a very lauded education system. So this is the central messaging that we still believe in. Fourthly, school leadership development. We don't need a chance. It is carefully discussed and prepared, and the reporting officers comprising a committee that carefully appraises the teachers would identify their what we call current estimated potential or CEP to see if they are suitable to be developed as school leaders. And they're not just left in school, they are given milestone leadership programs which we are going to be studying in phase two, known as the Leaders in Education program. 
They are taken out from schools and prepared for six months full-time by the National Institute of Education. Fifthly, it is really about systemic coherence and goal alignment. So there are careful conversations between the Ministry of Education that sets the initiatives as policymakers, the National Institute of Education that prepares all schools for Singapore, and the 360 schools that are delivering the curriculum. And last but not least, we are always reminded that um, exactly when you should not be resting on your laurels is when you are at the peak of so-called educational success. And we constantly believe in learning from other systems. And we are constantly thinking, even as we are being so-called admired by other nations, what is it that we can do better? What can we learn from the other countries and jurisdictions that, we're stu that we've been studying? And I think um, Singapore has benefited extremely from the Global Education Innovation Initiative by being a partner. Well, thank you so much. So I think this sets the table for a conversation. Let me be provocative because my takeaway from uh, what I've heard so far is a little disagreement that these skills are important, a lot of agreement that it's extremely difficult to construct real opportunities for teachers to do what Jalanta does in all schools. So one option is the Singapore way, which is a story of ambition, remarkable coherence in how people understand the goals of the system at different levels, extreme investment in building the capacity and the professionalism of not only the teachers, but anyone who works in the system. But the Singapore story is also a story of remarkable continuity uh, of goals of reform, but also the staff that do the reform, and also of limited dissent. It is clear that education uh, in Singapore is expert business. And it is not possible in Singapore just for anyone off the street to get up in their little box, soapbox, and start berating your goals or the government or suggesting they do something else. And that is not the condition in many other nations. So I'm going to suggest an alternative to the Singapore way just for the purpose of being provocative and in the spirit of he hearing you react to at least two other alternatives. So one is, if this is very difficult, maybe we shouldn't do it. Maybe we should stick to the basics. Maybe we should admit that these institutions that we have invented called schools uh, were designed to do something different at a different time. And maybe we should just try to stick to that and let someone else take care of the development of the whole child. Maybe what schools should do is to teach reading and writing. That's an alternative to the Singapore way. Another alternative is if the problems are governments, because they don't understand the complexity, they shy away from it, maybe we should just give more autonomy to teachers. And maybe the way forward would be to give extreme autonomy to schools and hope that they will have teachers like Jolanta who will find a way <coughs> to do what is in the best interest of their children. What are the reactions to each one of you to these two provocations and in general to what you have heard? And then let's engage our audience. Who'd like to go first? I think that we can't give up. Why? We must try, we must find way to, ways to show our students the world. Why? I'm the Why best. should we do that? Because I know, because when I was a child, uh, I used to live in only one country. I didn't know anything about others. You know, my mind was closed. When I was adult, I started to learn English to, to, to be close to the world, to learn from each other, from mm. other teachers, how to change my teaching method. Mm. And I know that in my case, uh, I changed a lot in my mind and in my teaching methods. And now uh, I try to do my best to convince teachers that we have to develop, have to change. And uh, if our curriculum uh, will not let us to change it in some case, it will be not good. Mm. We must try. Um, well, so definitely we, we don't have to give up. Why? First, because. Uh, we can do it, you know. It's, uh, we have the capacity of doing it. Mm. Uh, as as uh, Ms. Lowe was saying, I mean, Singapore, Finland are showing how to build spaceships. Mm. Um, and knowing, I mean, they might start from a different uh, uh, background and, and starting point that where Argentina would start now, still, we know, I know that we, we have the capacity. I mean, we have two Argentinian teachers here, where two, part of the 50 finalists of the prize. And we have 1.2 million teachers in Argentina. 
and I'm sure that we can, we can work with them to build a spaceship. Mm. So we don't have to give up on the spaceship. Now, I agree that we need to give more autonomy. But speaking only about Argentina, before that, we need to give teachers the capacity to be autonomous. Sure. And, and, and that's, I think, at what I face as a, my biggest challenge. I mean, I think, unfortunately, we build schools we have two problems. First is, in, in teaching schools, we are teaching mechanics, auto mechanics, mm. right? Not spaceship mechanics. Mm. So we need to you know, leave the old schools behind, and we need to build NASA-type schools where teachers will become astronauts, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and they can drive and work on the on spaceship. So, so that's one of the biggest challenges we have. The second one is, the second one is, um, schools themselves. Uh, one of the biggest restrictions we have today to go to a spaceship is that the schools we work on are constrained. The way they build, the, the way they are designed is for the old system. Mm. So, so our biggest initiative regarding schools is gonna be get the school out of the school. Mm -hmm. Start getting the school community of the school to show that this holistic learning we want to go to, mm. this building of a citizenship of the 21st century, this building of competencies, of abilities, of capacities, ha can be done outside the school. Mm. And give, by doing that, you are freeing up the teacher too, that is not constrained to that classroom anymore, that can work with the tools and the cultural and, 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 and uh, uh, social capital that was built in the, in the community. So we're going to start doing this in 70 cities all over the country, where we are going to show how this can work, uh, expanding the classroom time mm. outside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. Your reactions? Unfortunately, I also believe that, I mean, it's not a question of giving up. There is no choice. Uh, essentially, especially in poorer countries like ours, if you really, if the purpose of education is to change the life chances of a child, what we're educating this poor child, as it is, she doesn't have access to capital. Mm. She doesn't have social capital. And you're now going to train her on what was required 50 years ago. Uh, and she's going to grow up. When she grows up, it's going to be 2035. Uh, I mean, there is no choice. You mm. have to remodel the school. There's a lot of conversations going around with international funding agencies and a few nonprofit things. That's too difficult to achieve. It's only possible by the elite. So let's at least do the basics. But the poor are voting with their feet. They are walking out of schools which teach basics because they don't see the value of that. It is more valuable to go with my father to the construction site and work with him. And then you label that as child labor. So the poor are voting by moving out of schools. And we imagine that they don't care about schools. Actually, they're more aware than policymakers. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're going out of schools because they realize the real skills are learned by going with the father to the construction site, by going with the uncle to run a small retail shop, they are doing project-based learning already. And that's what we don't recognize. The poor are actually smarter than the, you know, <laughs> the elite who are sitting around because they've already figured this out. Uh, and that's not child labor. That's just because in your school, you could have provided a better environment in which this could have been done. It could have been debriefed, these projects. But we're not able to provide that environment. So I think we have no choice. So we have no choice. Let's see if we can solve that in the remaining 30 hours. Uh, 30 minutes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was a lapsus. Uh, so I'm going to ask you now to take two minutes and talk to the person next to you, ideally someone you don't know, about what is it that we can do to solve the paradox. If we have no choice, how do we do it? I want you to take two minutes. You need to be efficient. And then we're going to reconvene. We're going to hear some of those ideas, and you're going to engage with our audience, OK? Great.
let's reconvene now. But judging from the buzz, <laughs> I think we have a number of good ideas in this room about how to close the paradox. So what I'm going to propose we do now is we're going to take two or three comments, ideally your propositions, and then we're going to get the audience to respond to those ideas, the feasibility and so on. And so let's take two or three of you, and then we're going to do several rounds of that sort. Please, can we have a microphone here so that we can all hear you? Yeah. So we have a completely broken system in South Africa. 20% of the system is working, 80% is failing. And what we've decided to do is to mobilize active citizenship and business leader knowledge and skills into those 80% of the schools. We've seen the impact of that happening in 405 schools where small groups of people, active citizens, business leaders have shown up and sharing their skills and it's absolutely remarkable. So, so I think that... You've built space in the curriculum to bring other people to share what they know in the school. No, also to, bring, to help with management and leadership development and just general support to the school because it's not possible for the teachers to do it on their own. So this is just... So our proposition is that... Uh, education has to be a national and a societal responsibility and we all have a role to play and we cannot all sit back and say the teachers are doing a bad job and complain and moan and groan about it. We can all get involved and business has a role to play. Thank you. That's helpful. Let's hear from two more. Thank you. Um, uh, in your background, you looked at uh, what is the missing group, I mean gap, in, uh, especially in universal education. Yes, you said there is a very good uh, transformation, but has that education been quality in most of these uh, implementing countries? The gap was that um, there wasn't good preparation for implementation so that stakeholders know their roles, for example, the community, the, the teacher and so on, and that lack of full uh, implementation uh, preparation brings in the gap. And also um, looking at what makes quality education so that it is in place before it is implemented. We need to, to look at those particular countries, for example, that have failed much as the children have gone to school, but you'll find that about 50% don't complete the cycle of universal. What is the reason? How can we implement it? I mean, um, bridge the gap. And then um, there is lack of real competencies in our education. So we need to identify what are the real needs in the employment, um, you know, places, and in self, you know, uh, sustainability as an individual, how can we integrate this within the curriculum so that right from the beginning, the child knows that I can be enterprising, I can employ myself, I can think through what is, um, um, uh, what I need to be so that I can uh, stand on my own. And that is, I think, what we can Perfect. Look Thank at. you. Let's hear one more. Please, can we have a microphone here? <clears throat> the lack of... <coughs> Hello. It works, it works. Hello. It's good. Yeah. 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 Lack of uh, teachers community in remote villages is one of the major causes which I have felt uh, in India. I am from uh, Dubai, based out of Dubai, and I run an initiative called Education for All. We invite the people with knowledge to give one hour a week, wherein they are able to contribute through remote uh, teaching. And this has been quite successful by giving connectivity to remote villages, and it has also encouraged people to know about the problems in the village. Being in Dubai, actually there are 25 teachers who have registered with us 
who are able to teach to the remote uh, children in India. So remote teaching is one area wherein the villages have to be provided, they have to be empowered, and there is a teacher and the school who are available to take this initiative forward. Okay, excellent. So we have three suggestions for how to close the implementation gap. The first one is break down the walls of the school so that you have much more robust collaborations from the community on a range of issues so that you bring additional human resources to help with the administrative and the teaching enterprise. Second one is develop real clarity about what quality means by way of a curriculum that really connects with the needs in the society at the level of very specific learning outcomes and competencies and make sure that that quality is shared so that education is indeed relevant to the kid and they don't conclude that they're better off going and working with their parents in the construction site. And the third suggestion is help provide the teachers with opportunities to continue to learn all the time. And in some settings, this, is, this uh, isolation of the teachers is a real barrier in rural settings. So I'd like to hear our panelists respond to those suggestions from your standpoint. Will they close the gap? How would you adapt them? When we get to you, to you Aditi, I'd love if you could say a word about how it is that the Gandhi, uh, Gandhi Fellows Program is trying to address the issue of teacher isolation and helping to build communities for professional development. Why don't you start, Esteban? Well, I, I completely agree with the South African suggestion. Um, this idea of getting the school out of the school is getting the community into the school too. So it's uh, back and forth, and, and we need to get communities involved. Um, I was uh, also, I think it was in the previous se session, they were talking about wars and how wars are impacting education and how education can have an impact in wars in the future. But in the present time, uh, we leaders need to, you know, to take action. And, and so we teach by example, and, and we're not being a good example in general. And, and I'm talking about Argentina only. Mm. Um, so we really need to, to work into the community, so I, I, I really uh, like that idea. Uh, I, I, I also agree um, with, with the, the idea of getting more tools into the teaching uh, for teachers to have access to best practices and, and, and uh, be able to share uh, mistakes and, and correct. I'm not sure about the curriculum, though. Um, if we're going to trust the teachers, we're going to have to build more freedom into the curriculum. We, we, we went a step on, on that way in the city by freeing up uh, curriculum time um, for teachers to decide what they want to do at, at that time. Um, and it, it was a challenge because uh, I mean, some of the teachers react with, with fear. In the sense, of, we don't know what to do with that free time, right? But most of the teachers appreciate the fact that you trust them in, you just set up the objectives, the long-term objectives of what kids are there for, right? And the objective had to be these capabilities. We, we are not job-oriented. Uh, we, we don't want a job-oriented system. The reason for that being is that uh, Going back to my kids, when, when they grow up, they're going to have seven jobs. This is what I mean. Future analysts uh, say, you know, seven jobs. Five of them, five of those seven jobs, do not exist yet. They're going to be created. So we need kids to face, to be able to face uncertainty, to be able to create those jobs. I mean, the wealth of a country, the wealth of my country, will be if. The human resources that come out of, uh, of schools, if the kids that graduate from our schools are able to create those, some of those five jobs that are going to be created. And so we need to be able to, do, to have teachers face that uncertainty. And so I, I don't like these roadmaps that are too strict where teachers you know, get into the classroom and, and go from point A to point B and from point B to point C. I mean, if the teacher wants to go from A to Z, I mean, she's, she should be allowed to, mm -hmm. she or he. But I think it's very, very important that this trust is given to the teachers. So it's part of, you know, uh, hygiene. And there is no question that where you have teachers like Yolanta or the systems that Singapore can educate, uh, that trust is going to be uh, well invested, yeah, well placed. Exactly. Uh, Yolanta, how do you respond to the three recommendations that the audience has made about how to close the gap? I like uh, that idea to open the school because I, I do it all the time and I see the impact, you know. Mm -hmm. So this is important. I think this is the best way to do it, to open schools to in other schools in local society, in the country, then 
uh, more, yes, in different countries. Now we have opportunities to cooperate using social media, uh, using uh, technology. So we have new chances. Many years ago, we didn't, uh, we, we couldn't do it. And I also like this point of view also. Right. It's, it's very important to, to believe in teachers, to give them support. Uh, I know that many teachers, they, they, they find each other because their curiosity uh, led them to do it. They find each other using social media. They, they cooperate, they teach from each other. This is very important. Great. Eileen, how do you respond? I like also the view that's made by the lady, which is um, one of the points that she raised, apart from partnering with the community, um, is the fact that there needs to be almost relooking of goals, curriculum goals, as well as um, articulation of these goals to teachers so that they understand it. And I'd like to share again the example of Singapore, where it's not a fixed curriculum goal that has guided us in all these 50 to 51 years. So we started in the beginning with um, the survival driven phase of education where it was very important for us to ensure that basic education was given to humans, which is our really only natural resource. We even had to buy water from our neighbor, which is Malaysia. But um, we buy water and we treat it and then we sell it back to our neighbor. Um, the, in phase two, of course, we went through this efficiency-driven phase of education where um, there was a need to reduce the dropout rates. And this was in the 1980s. In phase three, we went to the ability-driven phase of education because it was necessary for us to realize that we needed to help each and every individual child achieve his or her potential. And currently, we're in the values-driven student-centric phase of education where we have kind of articulated what we call the, I keep calling it the spring roll, but it's a Swiss roll, isn't it? Yeah, in the Western context, it's the Swiss roll. It articulates the 21st century competencies framework that Singapore uh, talks about. It's not very much unlike what you see in 21st century documents, but truly it is about an emphasis on <coughs> civic awareness, uh, global awareness as well, cross-cultural awareness, creative and inventive thinking, communication, collaboration, and all that sort of things. But right in the center of this Swiss role, you see core values, that values form the central pillar of building a society. And we do articulate this very strongly to teachers in schools, but interestingly, in our teacher education model, it is also very much a values-driven paradigm. So this is to share in the vision that it is important for us to keep relooking our goals for education and also clearly articulate these goals to the community. Thank you, Ling. Aditya, what's your response to the three recommendations? Yeah, I'm also tempted to uh, agree with the opening up of the school. I think schools have been extremely closed systems, unlike in the case of most other professions. You, are, you don't need to ask a lawyer to open up. You don't need to ask a medical system to open up. The, the profession has its own set of skills, and you hand over all your power to that professional. I think education, although we're a profession, by definition, education happens through society, and it's a cultural and a social process. So I think our profession needs to reorganize in a different way compared to other professions like the legal or the medical or the accounting profession, because we need to engage with society a lot more. We can't be closed. And I think we've gone in the direction of getting extremely closed and believing only we know. And we've got stuck there. And now we need to unwind ourselves from that direction. Mm -hmm. um, and in that direction, I think I have two sort of provocative things to sort of say. If we believe this is an emergency, then it's literally like a draft, right? I mean, the, I mean if there is war, you draft your citizens to do something. Uh, education is in a similar emergency. Now, but you're not, parents are not willing to spend that two hours with the child to talk through or to do a project, right? And they think, no, that's a school's responsibility, yeah. right? Businesses, while they're complaining that the graduates that are coming out are no longer valuable, are not willing to spend the time that's required to create the internship or to create the volunteering opportunities. So I think unless that changes, the responsibility will come back onto the teacher mm -hmm. uh, to need to do the higher goals, which I don't think is really fair. You're neither providing the professional development nor are you volunteering. So like there is in most countries a ratio saying 25 to 1 should be the teacher-student ratio or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. 20 to 1 or 25 to 1. Should there also be a ratio of the number of hours a parent commits to spending with the child mm -hmm. in the school or with other children? Mm -hmm. Should there be a time that business commits to spending time with the school? 
mm. right? So the teacher is not under pressure all the time. Mm. So it's very nice to say open out the school. Again, pressure is back on me as the teacher. Mm. And you may or may not come. And then you'll come, you'll have a half-brained idea, you know, which doesn't even work with the overall thing. You'll then be dominant, then you'll judge me and you'll go away again. You know, so that's not the way to engage. I need to have, you know, you need to have a policy framework within which this operates, which is, I think, very, very important. Thanks, Aditya. Just another round. This was good. Let's hear from three others. Yes. Can we have a microphone here? Armand. Hi. I'm really enjoying the panel. Uh, my question is, is we had the discussion, but what about empowering the students? Ask the students what they're interested in. Right now at our school, we have uh, very innovative leaders. And what we've gone with is with the Pixar or Google model, which is 80-20, and we give a day a week where they work on passion projects. So I teach modern history, and one day a week, they link a passion project to curriculum. So I have students that are interested in yoga, mm -hmm. and they're comparing, they're actually saying that yoga was the lead motivator for the social rights movement in the United States through Martin Luther King. Is it a stretch? Yes, definitely. <laughs> but uh, what she's trying to prove is because yoga was centered to Gandhi and Gandhi was centered to Martin Luther King, then yoga is the direct uh, correlation to the social rights movement. And what am I to say no to that? Mm -hmm. So by empowering the students, she is now networking and uh, she's reached out to Martin Luther King's kids. Uh, she's uh, now reaching out to yoga experts, she's doing all sorts of things, but it's just by empowering the students mm -hmm. and me being a facilitator, and she goes out and gets the community and asks the questions that she wants an answer to, instead of me going, or like you mentioned, having somebody come in with a half-minded half idea. So my question to you is, what do you think about that type of uh, situation where we set it up, but give them a chance within the curriculum so there's essentials in the curriculum they need to learn, but their soft skills are learned through a passion project of their own. Okay, let's uh, hold up and think about it as we hear two more. Yes, can we have a microphone up here? Morning. Uh, I've been responsible myself for curriculum design, and my area, which was English as a second language, uh, Though being prescriptive, because that was the uh, requirement we had from the government, we had some, uh, we left some aspects uh, to, uh, I mean, for, for teachers to be free, to feel free about it. And we found teacher resistant, resistance in some way. So that was not too successful. So I agree with the minister when he says that uh, curriculum has to be free, but I think through experience that probably if we have a student-centered teaching more than teachers oriented, that would be the more successful option. Thank you. Another, another comment? Can we have a microphone up here, please? Hi. Um, I'm Salima. I'm involved in the professional development of teachers. Uh, while Singapore is fortunate enough to have a policy involved um, at their country level to in the, in the professional development of teachers, um, in India I would see that coming, I don't know when it, that happens where there is a national level policy on the professional development of teachers and uh, where you spend 100 hours for the professional development. I think the PLCs, um, the idea of uh, professional learning communities for the teachers would be something um, that can be taken up, um, if not by the policymakers, some platforms like Global Education Forum, helping a country to create those small uh, learning. Because what she what she says, 360 school would be my one state school, right? So, and that would be successful if we go, you know, for India, something like this, for a large scale where we have a lot of schools it would be difficult. But having some kind of professional learning communities um, created by these kind of platforms while the policies are shaping up or it might get impl implemented. Or like we say, the student empowerment needs to be done emergency because by the time you empower your teachers, mm -hmm. these students are already ready to you know, learn something. So how much time do you still want to give the children um, to fill that gap? I think professional learning community is something I'm 
Good. Please. Can you pass the microphone to the lady with the black shawl in front of you? No, in front of you, right here, this lady. Yeah. I'm going to ask um, you to make a suggestion as someone who has worked for many years in the professional development of teachers, around literacy, and other areas. So we basically have on the table two propositions. Two of the ideas are very similar. One is open up the curriculum so that the students have some choice as to what they want to study and how. And then this notion that, yes, providing freedom to teachers sounds like a good <laughs> idea, but if the teachers are not well supported, it may be an idea that is going to be met with resistance. It's challenging. And then you begin to articulate that one of the things to do is to provide teachers a community. And you didn't get to tell us what you do. Uh, you're going to hope you're going to do it now in rural India about that. So Beatrice, um, do you have any recommendation as to how do we close the gap between these aspirations of 21st century education and crime? Well, I think that uh, many things are needed. So we need to work in different uh, directions at the same time. There's no one uh, silver bullet that can solve the problem. And, but I think it's important to keep in mind that teachers need support. Uh, they need to be empowered, but they are afraid. I, I can see this very easily, so I work with, with teachers, and they are afraid of, of, of having the responsibility because they don't have the whole background that is needed for that. So they never experience those capacities that we are asking them to put in the, in the classroom. So I think we have to match many things and to develop some knowledge that can help them to organize and, and systematize. I think we have to create collaborate, collaborative spaces. And um, I think also we have to, I, don't, I am a little bothered when I see uh, skills for the 21st century separate of the cognitive development and the content. Mm -hmm. I think pedagogical situation must face what is the, what is the, the society, where is the society going to? So through the, the, the knowledge situation in the classroom, mm -hmm. we have to bring up the values, we have to bring up the capacities and the learning the content. So it's all together. I don't like when we separate things. Okay, let's uh, hear from, the, from uh, the panelists, and I'm gonna ask Aditya to go first, then Jolanta, then Lynn, then Esteban, okay? What's the question? So how do you respond to the three ideas that are in front of us as a way to close the gap? Let the students decide a portion of what they wanna teach and so on. Be wary of the notions of giving autonomy to teachers who are not prepared because there is a reasonable fear of freedom. Uh, there is a reasonable free fear of being asked to do something that you don't know how to do. And then the other two recommendations are, well, find ways to support the teachers and develop very good professional development. And maybe you can start by telling us what it is that the Gandhi Fellows do in Rajasthan. So we run a program called the Gandhi Fellowship. Uh, we recruit young people uh, who are just out of university, uh, maybe worked a couple of years, but young people. And this link that we spoke about between communities, businesses, and schools, I think you need specific amount of investment in additional human power to cause that link. It's not going to happen with 5% of the teacher's time because it is so regressive at the moment in countries like India because schools have become so closed. Communities have been told, stay out of it. Businesses have been told, stay out of it. So if you don't have a fellow who actually links the community, and we use the Gandhi Fellow as a concept, but you could use any other concept. I'm just making the case for you need intensive investment of a person who understands community organizing, understands the school, understands business, and brings these together. And let me give you a few examples of what uh, Gandhi Fellows have done. Right? We work in rural communities where this is first generation learners. Now, as a policy person, you recognize, yeah, you've got some facts that, yeah, these are first generation learners, their parents don't know. Now, when the parents don't know, how do the parents reinforce learning or reading? Because the parent doesn't even have a magazine or a book in her own house. So how is she going to reinforce learning? This boy, what he did was, in the entire village, he stuck small pieces of paper inside the house saying, this is rice. This is the door. This is the window. This is this thing. He just stuck these pieces. So at least the child is getting the reinforcement. And this he worked out with the community. So there's an entire village now where even if you go out into the park, because there's nothing in the village at the moment where there is anything literate, because the entire village is illiterate. So there is no reinforcement of the child. Even if you go to a small restaurant, there is no menu card. He tells you what is happening, because it's an oral thing. Now, 
you know, you can't expect the teacher to come up with this idea also, understand this issue also, execute that as well. So I think you need more manpower to do this. Another great example of what a fellow understands. So when there's a specialist role of a person who's bothered about bringing business, community, and school together, another beautiful example, he noticed that grandmothers knew the stories about values. And those had stopped being told because now the stories are only about what is in the textbook. Mm. So he went around with a little tablet and recorded grandmothers and the traditional tales of the village, right? And got them to play back, got the teachers to use that in the classroom, right? So again, and so the grandmothers are proud, the traditional tales have a lot of values in them, and then got the grandmothers to come in and tell those tales as well. So these links require a lot of effort, uh, and you need, I, I'm going to make the case, that's why I made the case for, you know, how much time is community going to spend or business going to spend? Or are you going to put in an additional resource for someone who's going to do this? At least for two, three years, if you don't pump prime it, you know, it's almost like those hand pumps that you need to get water. You need to put in a little water, and only then the water will come out from the earth. You need to put in, you know, you need to put in that investment. And we're hoping to achieve these higher goals without putting in that investment. And I think that's unlikely. Thank you, Aditya. Yolanta. Uh, I think that it's good to let students even my students are very little, but uh, I very often ask them for help or they can choose the topic we are going to talk about, mm -hmm. to, to learn. And even if I propose projects, a training project for them, the topic, they can say, no, we are, interest, we are not interested in. Mm -hmm. So the most important for me is to give them chance to talk with me, to discuss, to ask them for the, uh, how uh, is their opinion, yes? So this is very important, and I, uh, I'm glad that I'm on the good way, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> about teachers. Uh, hopefully, it really gives opportunity to teachers to develop. There are many courses, free courses online. So in Poland and in Europe, teachers have lots of opportunity to develop. I'm happy I'm a winner. That's great. Ilin. I totally agree about learner autonomy and when we talk about values-driven teacher education model, our first value is in fact learner-centeredness. So in order to connect this learner-centeredness into our teacher education curriculum, in 2005, we designed a core course known as Group Endeavours in Service Learning. So all our student teachers are broken into groups of 20 and they do need to engage in a community project of uh, their choice. However, they do need to do a needs analysis go out there to the community and find out what the needs are. So I'll give you an example. Some of, a small group went out to an uh, old folks home and realized that the old folks home has just been painted twice in six months. So they can't do something like that. But um, an example of a project that I led was um, when the student group decided to work with the Retinitis Pigmentosa Society, a debilitating eye disease that affects about 1% of Singapore's population. They raised $5,500 for the purchase of assistive technology for sufferers of this disease. They also worked together with ophthalmologists to prepare a pamphlet that could increase public awareness of the disease. So these are some examples where um, it really looks at what learner autonomy and learner-centeredness looks like when enacted in a curriculum. And I think it's perfectly doable. Uh, Yolanta has said and alluded, alluded to the same thing as well. We can do it in teacher education. We can do it right in our classrooms and we can give students the opportunity to engage in passion projects, as you call it. I really like that name. Yeah. Yeah. Esteban. So, so there is a, I think like uh, a supposition we're making that the problem we face when teachers resist change or resist uh, freedom is training. And I, I would argue that that might be one of the issues, but also what kind of incentives are we putting in the system for innovation, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of motivation do teachers have in the system to innovate by themselves? You know? Going back to the image, what happens today if a teacher gets into a car and says, well, I want to make this car fly, right? Uh, what is the reaction of the rest of the, of the teachers in that car? Are they going to say, okay, maybe we can build a, a plane out of this car or not? And I think uh, in general terms, going back to Argentina, the system will react in general terms with no incentives. So we need to also look at what are we putting in place if we, because if we train the teachers to be astronauts, but we put them in cars, we're going to frustrate them. So that's one of the biggest problems I, I, I think we, we need to put on, on the table. Because I think an empowered teacher will empower students. I mean, 
if you empower the teacher, you, you don't need to empower the student. The teacher will do it, right? So when the system works correctly, uh, as, as you did or as uh, Dava is doing in their school, and you see it in Argentina, uh, there is a reaction immediately in a change of atmosphere and environment in the school. Very quick example, we, we chose schools on the poorer uh, area in Buenos Aires. And we did, we, we sent some of the teachers and the leader of the school to schools in Finland, in Sweden, in the US. When they came back, the environment changed. And some of these teachers, the first time they met me, just blasted me. You know, it's like, you're going to destroy public education. Uh, I belong to a party that is supposed to be uh, private uh, friendly. Uh, the truth is, one day realized we were working uh, towards improving their chances of being successful as teachers. They change the attitude, and the school changes the environment. So, so we really need to do this at the national level. And I think it, it has to do with the fact that we need to put the right incentives in the system too. So as you get ready to leave, I'm going to ask that you stay an extra 30 seconds in your seat. And you close your eyes and think for yourself, what can you do to advance this movement? Because you see, I think we're part of a movement that began 400 years ago with a tragedy, when two young boys and their mother died. And they died because they were refugees, the victims of intolerance. Their father was a man named John Amos Comenius, who had religious views that were not popular at his time. And the fact that they were unpopular caused people to set his house on fire. And they had to become a journey where they were refugees uh, throughout what would be the Czech Republic. This man, who was a philosopher, had the um, foresight to ask himself, why do we do these things to one another? Why do we kill each other w over differences? And he said, we do that because we don't, know, we don't have the means to work out our differences in peaceful ways. And he said, we should educate everybody. And that idea, that powerful idea, was the beginning of this remarkable change that humanity has experienced. Until Comenius put the idea forward, no one had ever thought that every person had the right to be educated. <laughs> And that idea took tremendous vitality two centuries later when another powerful idea, the idea that ordinary people could rule their lives, spread throughout Europe and involved people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and like Adam Smith in saying, you don't need to have your life determined at birth or determined by someone else. Ordinary people have the capacity to rule themselves. And that idea gave birth to the notion of democracy and to the public school, the first public education system were built by the new democratic republics. And the idea took on global significance 70 years ago, when again another group of visionary leaders got together and looked at the devastation caused by World War II and again asked themselves, why do we do these things to one another and how do we make sure that this never happens again? And they drafted this beautiful document, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that said, the only way we're gonna have peace in the world is if we build an order an order that gives every human being certain rights just because they are human. And one of those rights should be the right to be educated. And that act of courage and that clarity of those three powerful ideas are the ones that have given us the ability now to stand on the shoulders of the giants who began this global movement and that have given every child on earth the opportunity to go to school and spend in that school a number of years. We know the job is not complete. That's why we're meeting. We know that we're not using that opportunity to give every child the opportunity to be empowered with the skills that will make them architects of their own lives. And so just like these things didn't just happen, they happened because there were people like you and me who took responsibility to make them happen. I invite each and every one of you to ask yourselves, what are you going to do to take this movement forward so that we actually build a world where every person has the skills to become the architects of their own lives and to make this world a place that is better and where we can live at peace with one another. Please join me in thanking these wonderful panelists. And I thank you for